Hi, I'm Joe Giordano, Cowens Industrials Automation and Robotics Analyst. I'm here in Detroit for Automate 2022, the first Automate show since the pandemic started. Today I'm going to be interviewing leadership from four companies, ranging on topics like potential demand in a recession, individual strategy, and sustainability. So first question, we saw an unprecedented jump in e-commerce spending uh, during COVID, accelerating a trend that was already in place. Now as things are normalizing, people going back to stores a little bit, people talking about recession, how do you think your customers will spend during, you know, potentially a down cycle? Yeah, that's a really good point. So actually in 2018, about 20% of retail sales were tagged as e-commerce. And by 2026, that's slated to double. Be right about roughly 40% of overall retail sales will be e-commerce. One of the things that's really attractive about Zebra is that our products and our solutions are really designed for helping retailers thrive in the on-demand economy. So what that means is, as they look at supply chain disruption, as they look at constraints on the labor that's available for them, they tend to prioritize making investments in the type of solutions that we deploy because it's so critical to how they not only need to operate but also how they need to grow over the next couple of years. It makes sense to, to lean into automation even more than they might have wanted to do already. We saw that with COVID. Automation is the only way out of the labor crisis, um, and the crisis is only going to get worse. It's accelerating. Um, it wasn't completely pandemic driven. I think a lot of it was pandemic triggered. I'll tell you, we haven't seen any slowdown in our clients yet. And, you know, I, there's a new normal for sure even with people going back to brick and mortar, the things that they subscribe to, that they added as their subscriptions over the you know, pandemic, they're not going back from. I mean, we're gonna end up moving a whole lot of bags of dog food because people just aren't gonna buy it at their grocery store anymore, that type of thing. What we do expect all through the chain, you're gonna see more people pushing for efficiency. You know, they're gonna have to get the same throughput through less real estate. So honestly, I don't think our customers' uh, spending patterns are going to change much. Uh, we serve the food industry almost uh, solely, and the pain in the food industry that was exacerbated by the pandemic is still there, and no longer is a human-powered supply chain even an option for the large food producers. So as you walk around a place like this, you can't help but notice how many companies there are and a lot of them seemingly attacking the same problems your customers would have. So how do you distinguish yourself among the crowd? Yeah, I would say that, you know, obviously the strength and the breadth of the portfolio is really attractive. We have a strong legacy and background over 50 years in business, and that started in printing, thermal printing, and into mobility and data capture. And now as we've been able to expand our portfolio through acquisitions of companies like Fetch Robotics, and just this week we announced the closing of the Matrox Imaging Acquisition, we now have a full portfolio that's not a single technology that we have to prescribe to a customer to help them solve that problem. Rather, it's a consultative conversation together with our over 10,000 partners across the world to really understand what's the problem they're trying to solve and then pull from a host of technologies to be able to go do that. A big part of our advantage is that we're established. We have thousands and thousands of robots in the field. We have hundreds and hundreds of sites deployed we're growing at an exponential rate. Robotics is a really nice, relatively small community of people. Um, and we're all very supportive of each other, but it's very hard. Even somebody who showed up right now and got everything right is still gonna have a very difficult slog uh, to, to become competitive. We're highly differentiated in the space we are in, which is food processing, right? So. That's the number one thing. The number two thing is our go-to-market model is different. Like we sell exclusively to machine builders. So OEM machine builders and system integrators. And the vision of the company is to put the power of soft gripping, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and 3D vision in the hands of what's basically a hardware integrator. Yes, there are lots of people trying to attack the warehouse automation space. and. You know, it sort of divides into the AMRs and then the picking side, right? Uh, and on the picking side where we live, it 
the differentiator in my mind is twofold. One of them is how do you view the problem, right? The company's named after this concept of let the robots do what they can most of the time of their own volition, but when they need help, have a remote human step in and fix the problem. And that's the thing. The robots will always need some amount of support. The rate of change in the warehouse is greater than the, the ability of AI to adapt. And I think you've said in the past that robots make lousy humans and humans make lousy robots. Right? That's right. Yeah. And robots don't really take jobs, they take tasks. Yes. And you know, that's what you want them to do. Robots make lousy employees. <laughs> They're really good at tasks though, if you can just give them, you know, circumscribe it to the task at hand. Historically, customers have always been intrigued by robotics, but there's always been this pilot purgatory about testing, 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 and not fully deploying. As solutions have multiplied and familiarity has increased, has it been more of a pull? Are customers willing to engage with you and want the stuff, know they want the stuff, and just want the best solution? Yeah, I'd say there's a lot less concept selling yeah. and a lot less convincing of, hey, this will work. Now it's a matter of distinguishing yourself to say, this is how we can deploy this together with our partners to ensure it works for you, not from a technology perspective, but from a workflow perspective. One of the things we saw during the pandemic, and it was the advantage of having a, a cloud-based infrastructure, is we could actually deploy mobile robots on site without actually having Zebra or Fetch employees come on site. That allows for more rapid deployment, and it reduces some of the burden that typically is on IT to get a project like this started. By removing some of those obstacles for entry, and plus just the labor constraints that we see in the marketplace, customers are liking less to do pilots and more of saying, hey, this is a site, let's fully deploy on the site, let's make it work, and then we can scale more quickly thereafter. Uh, MHI just published a report that showed just the growth in warehouses and DCs that are planning on bringing robotics in over the next 24 months. That wasn't the case you know, you know, yeah. two or three years back. So they clearly understand they have a labor problem and that automation can help. You can get stuck doing one pilot after another, after another, after another. We choose not to do that. So at, I think about pilots and first articles as different things. Where a pilot means I have to go develop something. The software as it is in the can won't right. do something the application requires. That's a pilot. I have technical risk. Because we have robots as a service, as an established method of going to market, uh, you can make a bigger bet and do a more genuine pilot. And so instead of trying one robot to see how it works in the factory, what you really need to do is go in with the entire solution, but in a business architecture that allows you to actually do a legitimate test. And robots as a service provides the opportunity to do that with a relatively low financial uh, barrier to entry. The pilot purgatory thing is not an issue for okay. us at all, primarily because of who we sell to. Yep. But that said, uh, what we're seeing is the food industry in mass is now locked onto robotic automation as the only viable solution to their labor challenges. Yep. Talk to me about your go-to-market strategy. We've written about, a lot about the concept of ecosystems. Some people are trying to build an ecosystem. Some people are part of someone else's ecosystem. Some people are point solutions that go through a distributor. Why, why are you doing what you're doing and why is that the appropriate strategy for you? Yeah, so I would say that we are, are very channel focused as a company. Yeah. We have over 10,000 partners that are helping us do business in more than 100 countries. Our primary go-to-market strategy is to go, to go to market through and with our partners. Now sometimes that looks like resale. Other times it looks like co-sell or just implementation looking at things like interoperability, and we always will continue to embrace a channel-centric go-to-market strategy. The ability to really help end-to-end -end from full service and support, and how important that is um, as these customers are adopting new technologies, it's critical that they know that, they're, that we're with them from the very beginning all the way through the process. And I think that's critical to the go-to-market strategy, to, to, as Jason was saying, to really scale. Well. 
I'll tell you, our business model is pretty straightforward. Sell to the customer in the way they want to buy, right. right? And some of them want to do it direct. Some of them have partners that they work with, et cetera. The you know, sort of truth of it is system integration is like mass or energy, right? It can't, you can't get rid of it. Right. Somebody has to do it. It's just to what degree and who are you going to put that on? Most of the time, you know, there's going to be a third party system integrator involved. Our view of it is that piece is secondary to driving preference at the end user. That's why we'll do that first article with them. We'll iterate on that until they get to this is what we want to deploy at scale. And then a system integrator is more apt to be excited about it. In the food processing space, 90 plus percent of all of the automation lines are produced by system integrators. Yep. And very few today end users do their own integration. And so our go to market strategy is uh, at the base level, focus on a key set of food system integrators, the large ones. Right. And then one layer on top of that, focus on the OEM machine builders who they buy their product okay. from. And the third piece is we market to the end users to create the awareness that no longer do they have to throw people at their operations. They can actually now adopt robotics. So we just published a big report uh, on the concept of robots and how they're being used incrementally as a tool in the climate change fight. We actually partnered with you guys. We use your solution as a test case. And I know you're a little bit more advanced on this topic than some others might be, but talk to us about how that concept is uh, discussed internally and has it worked its way into customer discussion. From a technical perspective, one of the things I love about robots as a service is that we own the robots. Right. We have a vested interest in getting them back, keeping them going, um, making them last as long as possible. We refurbish them um, and send them out again. We have a full task force that's going through and um, building and expanding on our framework and then taking each piece of the E, the S, and the G to really figure out how best and um, we're going to work for internally as well as how it's going to benefit our customers. It's looking at the entire portfolio that can help customers measure and manage their carbon emissions. Now specifically for AMRs, most customers are talking to us about how they can increase their fulfillment speed, how they can redeploy labor that is otherwise just moving and walking from one point to another being able to help them do what's their best at and ultimately allow the AMRs to take a lot of the repetitive, the dirty, the dangerous things out of that particular human workflow. We know that there's going to be more emphasis on this as it goes along. Robots and people take up the same amount of room at the point of work, but in the overall enterprise footprint, if you want to call it that, the robots actually take up less. And that's true on the sustainability side too. I think we're in a unique position to affect uh, the like ESG profiles of large uh, and food producers. So one of the one of the obvious ways is um, you know food is grown or harvested, raised, right, and then it's brought to processing facilities, and it's they're per it's perishable. So if they can't get the workers that they need at the right time to process the food, it yeah. goes to waste, right. and all of the natural resources that go into raising or growing that food is wasted. And so that's the most obvious way, right? How do we help the end users keep up with the demand for a product? I think it's pretty clear that spending patterns are expected to be really strong, kind of no matter what the economic scenario is like. Now, I caveat that a tiny bit, I think it's easy to say now, before things are bad, that things are going to stay good if it gets bad. We'll see. Robotics is no longer and necessarily just an IRR play. If, if we want to grow, there's simply not enough people to do these jobs. You need to have solutions like this in place or you won't be able to meet end demand. I think, secondly, sustainability is something that's coming up more and more. There's companies here at varying points in their own internal journeys on sustainability, but it's clear that they know it's going to be a focus. It's, clear that their customers are thinking about robotics more holistically in how robotics are going to help them achieve their own targets. This is a topic we just explored in our research. Um, I think it's going to become bigger and bigger as if I'm having this same conversation two years from now here. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. I got another 500 boosts to hit, so I'll see you later.